put on this cloudy, uh, humid night. Um, I wanted to introduce Kyle Shute. Uh, Kyle Shute uh, is from, currently from Maine. He's just finished up his master's program at the um, Clemson University in the Wildlife and Fisheries Department. His thesis was on bats, uh, specifically habitat associations of sensitive species, bat species um, of the coastal South Carolina area. And uh, one of the cool things is a species that's down there, the northern long-eared, is also here in New Hampshire. So it's a good, good topic to have um, in this insect-flooded world. Uh, Kyle uh, grew up in Maine and uh, did his undergraduate work at the University of Maine in Orono. Uh, he spent uh, quite a few summers working on a variety of wildlife projects, uh, including small mammals and amphibians and spotted owls. I think you could say he got he got bit by the bat bug, but I don't think he really got bit by bats there. But when uh, when he took a class trip to Peru uh, and learned a lot about bats in that area, so that's where that some of that passion started. I think um, we're really happy to have him here, and uh, I think you'll find the information 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 useful and interesting. And Kyle, I want to thank you for. Uh, sharing your knowledge and your enthusiasm about these furry little winged mammals. So thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen now. And can everybody see that? Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Lynn. Um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about pretty broadly what bat conservation is. I'll be talking about some ecology of bats, be talking about threats to them, and more specifically what you can do. Um, and so I'm going to just turn off my camera too so my bandwidth is a little better and I'm not slowing down quite so much. Um, there we go. So uh, a little bit of an overview about how this talk is going to be structured is I'm going to talk about globally, um, I'm going to give you some information about bats, talk a little bit about why bats are important, um, then more specifically some of the bats that are in New Hampshire, um, as well as those conservation threats that bats in New Hampshire face. And then I'll sort of wrap everything up with what you can do to help bats um, in your everyday life. And so Globally, I'll start off with there are 1,421 different species of bats across the world. Um, and you can see just from a couple of these pictures that not only in what they look like, um, but also their ecology, they're very diverse. Um, in fact, they're the second most diverse group of mammals. Um, and if you, I put these pictures up here so that we can sort of get a sense of what these different bats are all like. Um, and so you sort of understand a little bit of this diversity. So if you look in the upper left hand corner here, um, you'll see an insectivorous bat, meaning an insect eating bat. That's typically what people think of when they think of what bats are and do, especially in the United States and in North America, because most of our bat species are insectivorous. Um, but there are lots of other species that eat and do a lot of other things as well. In that upper right hand picture, you'll see a fruit bat. Um, there are lots of different types of fruit bats across the world, many in Southeast Asia, some in Africa, some in South America, um, and they're eating those fruits. Uh, in the lower left hand corner, you'll see a, a nectivorous bat, uh, more specifically the lesser long-nosed bat, which is a species that much like hummingbirds drinks nectar out of flowers and very specifically agave plants. So they're a really important um, species in terms of tequila production because they pollinate a lot of those flowers, which I'll talk a little bit more about in this next slide. Um, and then in the bottom right hand corner, there are also um, one of my favorite bat species that not a lot of people know about. Um, this is the bulldog bat and it's a, a piscivore um, or a fish eating bat and they're uh, native to South America, um, one of the bats that's um, fairly common in Peru and not, not many people often know that there are species of bats that eat fish, um, which is another really interesting uh, diversity in this group. And so you might ask the question why bats are important um, and especially in terms of this diversity and 
one of the biggest um, facts that I find hits home with a lot of people, especially in the U.S., is they contribute an estimated $3.7 billion to the U.S. economy each year. And this is in terms of agricultural pest reduction. So in eating those, um, those agricultural pests, they actually contribute quite a lot to the agricultural industry here in the U.S. Additionally, they also help reduce reduce disease carrying insect pest populations, particularly if you think about um, mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus. Um, they, the consumption of these insects uh, by bats reduces these populations. Um, as I also sort of alluded to in the last slide, they're important seed dispersers and pollinators. So they're moving between lots of these flowers, pollinating different flowers, as well as those fruit eating bats um, will consume fruit at a site disperse to a different area and then excrete those seeds, um, allowing those seeds to germinate in different places. So they're really important seed dispersers as well. And finally, they're also very um, useful indicators of a healthy ecosystem. We can tell that um, an ecosystem is healthy and intact when there are bats there, um, because it means you know there are insects there, it means that there are sources of water there, it means that there's places for them to roost and forage. Um, so they can tell us that there are healthy ecosystems present as well. But bats are also threatened globally. This figure on the left is, shows the proportion of threatened species of bats um, within these different threat categories. And you'll notice that a lot of these categories are based on loss of habitat. So loss of roosting structures from logging and harvesting of plants, loss of forests from agricultural land use change, um, some reduction in populations from hunting and collecting of animals, human intrusions and disturbance, urban development uh, in terms of habitat loss again, as well as energy production and mining and climate change and severe weather events all rank as some of the most pressing threats to bats. Um, so they do face quite a, quite a few different threats and a pretty large diversity of those threats as well. And at this point, I'm gonna shift into the bats that are here in New Hampshire specifically. Um, and of those 1,421 bat species, there are actually only eight species of bat in New Hampshire. Um, but this doesn't mean that there's any lack of diversity in the bats that are there. Um, so you'll see all of these species, and I'm going to go through a little bit um, and talk about how we sort of group all of these species together in terms of what their ecology is like, um, which is mostly based on their roosting ecology. Um, but we have the little brown bat, northern long-eared, eastern small-footed, tri-colored, big brown, hoary, silver-haired, and red bats. Um, and there is quite a bit of diversity within these. So, so like I said, I'm going to sort of break these down into different categories um, of what these bats roost in. And these aren't necessarily um, categories that are very firm. Um, there's a little bit of mixing between the categories. But I'll start off by talking about um, what I classify as sort of variety roosters or opportunistic roosters. Um, and these are the little brown bat and the big brown bat mostly. And this is because they often take advantage of human structures um, like attics and barns. And they also take advantage of sort of random miscellaneous other structures as well. So every once in a while you'll find them roosting in stuff like wood piles or stone walls. Um, they can be pretty uh, flexible in where they're roosting, but often these are bats that you'll see in human structures and buildings, particularly big brown bats, um, because they're doing pretty well uh, across most of their range. These are very often the bats that you see in um, either your attic or your barn um, out flying around right after dusk that may have come from some structure on your property. We also have um, what I like to call sort of tree trunk roosters. Um, and these are the northern long-eared bat and the silver-haired bat. And I call them tree trunk roosters because they use a variety of different structures sort of in that central part of the tree. So they'll use stuff like shedding bark. Um, they'll use cavities in tree trunks. Um, either basal cavities down at the bottom and the base of the tree um, or other cavities, uh, potentially ones that have been made by, um, made by woodpeckers uh, or something along those lines. They'll also use snags or dead limbs pretty much anywhere in the tree that they can sort of wiggle their way into um, to roost. 
there's only really one species in this group uh, that I call the rocky roosters, um, and they use a variety of uh, rock-based and mineral structures. So the eastern small-footed bat will often roost in sort of rocky outcrops um, with boulders and fissures, anywhere that they can sort of squeeze into. They'll sometimes roost in talus slopes, um, so those more uh, loose rocky slopes, and every once in a while you'll find them um, in sort of mock rock structures like dams. If there are um, fissures or cracks in dams, uh, this species can crawl into those spaces as well. And then the last group, um, and my personal favorite group, are the summer foliage roosters. Um, and these are the hoary bat, tricolored bat, and eastern red bat. And um, they often will use, particularly here in the northeast, clusters of dead pine needles, um, clusters of dead broad-leaved tree leaves, um, like oaks and maples. Anytime you see a cluster of leaves or pine needles that's hanging down um, and it looks like there might be the opportunity to, to crawl up in there, um, this is those kind of structures that these bats are using up in the canopy of various trees. Um, and, every, and specifically, the, this lichen structure um, comment is in regards to tricolored bat populations in Nova Scotia, um, which have been found to use uh, old man's beard lichen hanging on a number of tree species um, that they can sort of crawl their way into. And so I've talked a little bit about what bats do in the summer, but another really good question is what bats, especially in the Northeast where winters are longer and more harsh, do in the winter. Um, and what they do is they sort of have a couple different tactics. Um, the little brown, northern, long-eared, eastern, small-footed, tricolored, and big brown bat are what we call cave hibernators. And they're those species that typically go into, you know, a bat cave as, as what we all sort of think of um, when we think of what bats are doing in the winter. And so they're going into those caves um, where the temperatures are more stable and they can have a stable microclimate. Um, so that it's easier for them to drop their body temperature down and survive the winter without having to consume more water or food resources when those are pretty scarce on the landscape. But there are also these other species, the hoary bat, silver-haired bat, and eastern red bat, which are migratory. Um, often people don't necessarily know that there are migratory bat species. They think of, you know, migratory bird species uh, that move between the northern parts of North America and southern parts of North America or even down into South America or further. Um, but there are also bats that uh, use the same migratory practice that will spend their winters down in the southern part of the United States or even into Mexico and then spend the summers um, in the northeast, uh, into Canada, and even up into Alaska. But unfortunately, all of these bat species that I've been talking about are threatened in the United States for, um, and, and more broadly throughout North America, for a variety of reasons. Um, but really what I want to hit home with this slide is that many of these bat species have experienced declines of up to 99% in some areas. And the first thing that I'll talk about um, as a reason that they, um, they are in decline is white-nose syndrome. And to give you a little bit of background, white-nose syndrome is a fungal pathogen that infects cave hibernating bats. Um, it was first discovered in central New York in 2007 and has pretty much spread outward to cave hibernacula across the eastern United States and is now even detected in parts of Washington, Texas, um, and even uh, in parts of California now as well too. And essentially what this uh, fungus does is it invades the cutaneous tissue of the bats. So it's invading their skin tissue, mostly in and around their nose and face, um, but also potentially on their wings. And what it does is it disrupts their patterns of torpor and hibernation during the winter. Um, and this disruption causes them to arouse out of hibernation um, and uh, make that metabolic rate go back up where they need to start potentially consuming uh, insects, drinking water, because they're depleting all of their fat stores. Um, and this is really one of the biggest issues um, because it's led to declines uh, in the southeast of up to 99% in some hibernacula. Um, so these bat species have really taken a hit in terms of um, this disease. And I'll back up a little bit and add that 
Um, the reason that this disease has hit so hard here in North America is because it was actually brought over very likely from Europe. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later when I'm talking about how you could help. Um, but a very similar fungus um, genetically to this disease uh, has been found in parts of Europe and caves there as well. Um, and the bat populations in Europe have uh, likely experienced this decline that we're seeing now in North America and then rebounded with individuals that are better able to survive this disease. Um, and so the conditions are really, you know, they're similar to those that are in Europe and than they are here. And that's really what allows this fungus to grow very well in these cave environments. One of the other issues um, that's causing decline of bat populations in North America is the development of wind energy. Um, and while the last slide I talked mostly about the conservation threats related to white nose syndrome as those um, that affect bats that are cave hibernators, this mostly impacts those migratory tree bats, um, those ones that are moving up and down North America, um, mostly because typically when these bats are migrating, they're going to sort of these same places that we're developing wind energy. You know, they're high up on ridges, there's a lot of wind, um, because obviously we wanna generate a lot of power from wind energy, but that's also what these bats are using to migrate. Um, in the Eastern US, the main corridor for movement of these migratory species is right up the Appalachians, which is um, a lot of where we're putting these wind turbines. Um, and so we've also seen pretty steep declines in some of these migratory species, um, and it's, but it's not all doom and gloom um, is what I'll say about it, because um, what scientists are working on right now is figuring out a couple of ways that we can try to make sure that these migratory bats aren't being struck by wind turbines quite as much. Um, so one of the things that scientists are working on are acoustic um, deterrents, which are essentially a very high frequency sound that is in hope um, would be heard by the bats um, and then cause them to move into different areas to avoid these wind turbines. Um, and that would keep them from being struck by the moving blades. Additionally, there's also some recent research that suggests that by curtailing the speed at which the wind energy, the turbines are moving by just a little bit, um, resulting in only a reduction of energy of about 1% energy production, um, can actually help uh, spare a lot of these migratory tree bats because it's going just slow enough that the bats are better able to um, avoid these turbines, avoid any um, changes in pressure that are associated with these turbines um, moving very quickly. And so there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of good news here uh, with this particular um, reason for conservation concern. And then the final one that I'll talk about um, is that associated with land use change. And so land use change is essentially when humans go into um, a natural area and remove large parts of that natural land cover. So oftentimes, at least in the Northeast, this is forest cover. Um, so imagine if you go into a forested area and remove all of it either for um, a urban sprawl or for agricultural land use change where you're planting crops to feed people, um, you can lose a lot of important habitat for these species. And so there's sort of two different types of this habitat um, loss associated, or this habitat um, change associated with uh, land use change. And the first one uh, that I'll talk about is habitat loss. And so imagine for a second this forested area um, where we have some bats that are moving around doing their thing, they're foraging in that, oh, those, that forested area, they're roosting in those trees during the summer, and then during the winter they still have access to this cave period, this cave structure um, during that winter period. And then we come in and develop um, some suburban sprawl and take out some of that forest. These same bats are now limited to this smaller area um, where they may still be able to access all of the resources that they need, but it may be a little bit clustered, um, maybe cramped for the number of individuals that are there. Um, and so there is that loss of habitat when bats may need that larger um, landscape and habitat context. 
And then the second part um, that I'll discuss is habitat fragmentation. And this is, um, again, let's imagine a, a similar situation where these bats have access to all these forests, this cave um, that they can use throughout the year. But then we have a large interstate that's put through the middle of it. And maybe um, because of the fast moving traffic and noise pollution, um, and even potential collisions with vehicles for bats that are trying to cross this area, um, we now have essentially two fragmented sites. So we still have a little bit of habitat there, not as much was lost um, as in our previous example, but now these two pieces of habitat are separated. So we have some bats that are over here on the left in the forest um, that can, um, they can still access their summer foraging and roosting areas, um, but they can't quite access that cave hibernacula that's really important during the winter. Um, and so it's keeping individuals from being able to access all of the different types of habitat that they need. And so for a second, I want to just go back to these bats of New Hampshire um, and more specifically talk about um, how they are impacted by these conservation threats. And we have the little brown bat, northern long-eared bat, eastern small-footed and tricolored bats that are all have been pretty heavily impacted by white nose syndrome with those really steep population declines. And then we have those migratory bats as those that are impacted by those wind, that wind energy development. Um, and really ultimately all of these species being impacted by habitat loss and fragmentation due to land use change. So this loss of habitat um, may seem sort of small scale potentially, but it can actually, when it's more broadly distributed across the landscape, really heavily impact a lot of these bat populations. And so, at this point, I'll sort of transition into how you can help um, because it is a little bit of doom and gloom um, in terms of bat conservation. And I, I don't wanna only paint that picture because there are some ways that you can definitely help. Um, and the first one that I'll talk about is how you can help uh, with white nose. And this is a little bit more specific to anyone that finds themselves ever going in caves. Um, but the way that this disease spreads is essentially when not only bats, but um, human cavers go into one cave and then go into another cave without um, properly decontaminating all of the things that they wore in that first cave. And so what you can do to help prevent the spread of white nose syndrome, if you ever find yourself going into caves, especially across long distances, um, is you can, one, make sure that you either are not wearing any of the same clothes that you wore or using the same gear that you had in that previous cave, or you can decontaminate them. Um, and the simplest way to decontaminate your clothing is to spray it with at least 70% isopropyl alcohol. Um, that's what we typically use um, for people that are bat biologists that are going into caves to do surveys or um, when we're in the field mist netting for bats, we're decontaminating everything so that we can make sure that um, we're not spreading it in between individuals during the summer. Um, you can also help provide resources for bats on your property. Um, and you can do this in a variety of ways. The first one is to retain a variety of trees that bats can, um, can and may roost in. And so, of course, there's a lot of variety in what kind of trees these bats are roosting in. Um, but making sure you have a diversity of forest structures and different trees can help make sure that you have um, a lot of different uh, possible roosts for bats on your property. You can also provide access to water sources. Um, and this is not only so that bats have a place that they can go get a drink of water, which is obviously really important, um, but also so that their uh, food sources and many times insects um, have places where they can develop so these bats have a food source. Um, additionally, you can avoid clearing large areas and removing a lot of forest. Um, and that forest foraging habitat. There are lots of species that um, take advantage of these complex forest structures for their foraging for insects, um, oftentimes grabbing insects off of, re resting insects off of trees and branches. Um, and so there are some bats that are specifically adapted to do that, um, but there are also some bats that use these more open forest types and open areas as well to grab insects out of the air. So making sure you have that diversity um, of forests, uh, or if you have hard edges too between very open areas like your lawn or a field um, and those more cluttered forested areas help provide um, ample foraging opportunity for many different species. Um, and finally, you can avoid the use of pesticides. Um, 
because when individual insects aren't killed by pesticides, but they still get those pesticides in them, they can actually bioaccumulate in bats, which means that when the bats are feeding on insects that have been exposed to pesticides, these concentrations of chemicals can build up in their systems and cause them harm. Um, you can also provide other habitat for bats in terms of bat boxes. Um, and if you go to batcon.org, which is Bat Conservation International's website, um, they have a whole list of certified, with this, uh, this symbol on the right, um, certified bat boxes that have links to websites where you can purchase them. Um, and they also have really great information about uh, where to put your bat boxes to make sure that they're, um, they, you optimize the probability that a bat will actually use it. Um, and so they have tons of great information about that, but you can help provide um, structures for bats to live in on your property in these bat boxes as well. Um, and this is especially important if you find that you need to exclude bats from your property. Um, and specifically, um, this is how we sort of keep bats away from interacting with humans too much. Um, in New Hampshire, if you find yourself um, that you have bats living in a human dwelling where there are also people living, um, you can exclude them from that area. And what this means is essentially, you know, if you have bats in your attic, you can hire a licensed professional to go in, um, evaluate it, seal up all of the cracks, and then what they do is they leave a one-way exit for bats to get out of. Um, so these bats, uh, after all of these holes are sealed up, go out the one-way exit and then can't find their way back into the building. Um, and so this helps keep people and bats um, separate from and, and keeps from those negative interactions happening. Um, because really what we want to do in terms of um, conserving bats is making sure that we're not responsible for um, any excess mortality. Um, there is a little bit of regulation on when you're allowed to exclude bats from. Um, Generally, uh, it varies by state, um, but generally you're allowed to do it after mid-August, and that's because this is the point when um, all of the individuals typically um, have the individual offspring um, have had a chance to develop enough where they can fly out, because you don't want to trap a bunch of baby bats inside of your attic um, and then allow all of the mothers to leave and not be able to get back into their offspring. Um, and, and really the reason that we want to do this is uh, I, I don't want to downplay um, the importance of staying separate from bats unless you are um, a trained professional, um, but it is possible that individuals do carry rabies, although that probability is very, very low. Only about 1% of wild bat population, um, of wild bat individuals actually carry rabies, so it's super unlikely um, that you'll actually even ever come in contact with a bat that has rabies. Um, but it is important to recognize that that is something we want to be aware of um, and make sure that we can watch these individuals in the wild and um, appreciate them there, but not uh, potentially have any conflict between humans and bats. And the last thing that I'll talk about um, in relationship um, to bats is really their relationship um, and the misrepresentation of their relationship um, with uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, because there's been a lot of misinformation out there about, um, about the context in which bats are related to this virus. And so I'll start out by saying that um, we don't really know where the source of this virus came from as scientists. Um, there are scientists that are working on it um, and similar viruses, similar coronaviruses, um, have been isolated in uh, horseshoe bats, which are um, endemic to Southeast Asia. Um, and so while this isn't the exact same virus, it is a similar, um, it does have a similar DNA structure uh, to the coronavirus that um, has more broadly spread across the world. Um, however, it's really important to note that US bats are not the source in any way, shape or form of this virus. Um, and in that sense, the bats that we have here don't pose a threat to humans um, in terms of COVID-19. Um, but it's important that we talk about this virus accurately and especially in terms of uh, how we communicate its relationship with bats. Um, 
it doesn't mean that there wasn't a jump from bats to humans of this virus or um, an evolved form of this virus. Um, but it's also possible that there were intermediate hosts, which means it jumped from a bat to some other animal and then to humans, or that it came from entirely different animals altogether, um, like livestock. Uh, coronaviruses are a very diverse group of viruses, um, and so there's really a lot for us to still learn about this issue. Um, one of the other things that I, I like to um, mention is that a lot of times um, in terms of bat conservation and COVID, the way that some people talk about it um, can be partially racially motivated. Um, there's a sort of underlying um, fear and misunderstanding that uh, there's a relationship with um, people in China who consume bats and the coronavirus. But it's really important to note that um, people in China who do consume bats are not very prevalent. Um, really, this is a, you know, this is a delicacy that's reserved for the top 1%. Um, most people in China are not eating bats. And so when we make comments about um, this relationship, it can be really damaging not only to bats, but also to people in other cultures as well. Um, And finally, um, the way that I'll sort of wrap this up is, is vilifying bats, um, especially in terms of this virus, won't help um, and can actually create aggression and the tendency uh, towards culls or retaliatory actions by humans towards bats. Um, so the, the biggest thing about that is sometimes these actions can actually increase prevalence of disease spread because what happens when people get angry at bats and then want to kill them um, or retaliate towards them is they end up being in closer contact with these species. Um, and that's really where we get these potential spillover events where we have a virus move from animals to humans. So really the best thing that we can do is limit our interactions between these animals, you know, be at a safe distance when we're seeing them, appreciate them out in the wild, um, but not get anywhere near them and potentially have that event of a virus moving from an animal to a human. Um, especially uh, in terms of habitat conservation. If we're protecting habitat for bats um, globally, then they'll have areas that they can stay in um, that are far from humans, and we have a lower probability of this, these spillover events um, creating the next viral outbreak. And so with that, I want to thank everyone so much for coming tonight, um, all remotely, of course. And uh, I hope that I have given you a little bit of information about bats, um, and I'm happy to take any questions that there are. I have a question. <laughs> sure. Um, well, yeah, I have a Can couple. My back. I, I wonder, um, yeah, maybe if you stop on sharing your screen, then we can see you big. Um, there we go. I have a couple of questions. One is, one is, um, can you can you speak about you know what what we lose when we lose large bat populations? You know how that affects yeah, the sure, um, including including us. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, one of the biggest things that we lose is those services that bats provide to people um, that we don't even think about typically. So um, those pollinators, um, those seed dispersers, those bats that are eating insects that we really don't like um, are all really important services um, that, can, uh, that can be lost when we do lose bat species. Um, and, you know, those are all, those are all great um, but the other thing that we lose is this value of biodiversity um, and these intact ecosystems, um, which I, I think can't be lost um, in terms of talking about how these, um, these bat species not only benefit us. We can talk about it uh, in terms of how they do benefit us, but it's also important to recognize that inherent value and the diversity of these really interesting animals. Um. We have a couple of raised hands. I have another question too. Peg, 
Do you want to unmute yeah. and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I just did. Um, I, I have been reading over the last couple of years about um, <clears throat> the decline in insect populations and diversity around the world. And I was wondering about the intersection between that and the bat uh, and the, the bats. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's definitely something to be concerned about um, because when you have those reductions in um, in insect populations, it can really damage um, damage what these bats are feeding on, um, and essentially removing a prey source um, from them. And so, especially here in North America, where many of our bat species um, are insectivorous we do face an issue of uh, losing large uh, prey sources for these bats here in North America. Are there any particular dangers in keeping bats in a bat attic? We have an old house and they uh, produce some dung obviously, but guano. Um, is there a concern other than getting into the rest of the house on occasion? Yeah, so you know it sort of depends on what the population sizes are like there too. You know if it's a handful of individuals um, it's, it may not be a huge deal especially if they're not coming into your house. Um, but what tends to be the issue um, is when you do get larger colonies that are you know producing a lot of guano and that's damaging um, parts of the house or they are coming into the house too those those really are the biggest issues but you know if you find that the bats are there they're not coming into the house um and you're not seeing that damage um i, I personally see no harm in them being close by um but you have to be cognizant that if you do end up getting to a place where bats are coming into your house, you may need to think about um, excluding them from the building. Thank you. Kyle, oh, that was such a nice talk. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it was also awesome to hear about these uh, New Hampshire bats. And my question is, I don't know how much you've been watching the white nose syndrome research in terms of the local New Hampshire bats, but how, do you know anything about our local populations? Are there any that are starting to rebound? Are there ones that are, that are doing better? I've heard in other parts of the country, we're starting to see some positive motion. And, um, maybe yeah, um, I can't speak too much to, um, to New Hampshire specifically, because um, my, you know, my research happens all down in the Southeast. Um, what I will say is that southeastern populations are starting to stabilize a little. Um, and, you know, granted, it's stabilization at a pretty low level. Um, but even in terms of, um, in terms of censuses that are, censuses that are done in hibernacula year after year, um, there is sort of now this slight uptick, slight downtick, but a little bit positive. Um, I think that that pattern is more broadly happening across areas that white nose syndrome um, has been in for a while. So I would tend to lean towards that it's starting to happen in the Northeast as well. Um, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Well, this is Maureen. Um, and I have a question about bat boxes. Is there are they sure. appropriate, you know, if you've got a kind of a uh, forested lot anyhow, uh, would you want a bat box there or where would they be appropriate? Yeah, there's definitely no harm in putting one up. Um, bat boxes can be a little bit tricky because bats are actually really picky in where they want to roost. Um, it depends on the species. Um, typically, bat boxes um, that are put up in the northeast generally are colonized by big brown bats um, although maybe you'll get um, little brown bats as well occasionally um, but if it's something that you're interested in um, it's definitely worth putting one up uh, and seeing what happens they can take a very long time to colonize um, especially because you know if a bat is not there already Bats tend to like to go back to places that they're familiar with, um, 
And, you know, sometimes that's the same place every night. And sometimes that's a couple trees within, you know, a couple acre area. Um, but it certainly doesn't harm um, anyone to put a bat box up uh, and see what you get in there. Although it may take a little while for bats to find it. Lynn, do you have a question? Oh, I was just going to, I think a question I often hear is, what, what do you do when you get a bat in your house? And I thought Kyle could share a little bit about that based on some experiences that we had over the weekend um, at our house. <laughs> and, and the best way to get a bat out of uh, your living room <laughs> and your kitchen when it's flying around. Yeah. Um... So, so definitely the first thing to consider um, if you do have a bat that's in your house is if it has been there when any pets were alone in the room um, or if anyone was asleep. Um, those are generally the two rules of thumb. If you do have a bat that's been in a room where there are either pets or someone hasn't been awake, um, the best idea is, and if it's possible, um, the best idea is to try to safely capture that bat either, you know, in a net or a, um, a bucket or something so that it can be tested for rabies. Um, because we like to, we like to be very cautious in terms of, um, in terms of when there's a potential for rabies exposure. Um, and unfortunately that often that does mean that, um, the bat has to be euthanized. Um, but what you should do if that is the case um, is call the, I believe it's the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Um, if you, you can look for their number um, and call them and they'll give you information on what to do next. Um, but if it's the case that a bat either flew in and it hasn't been around people or pets or anything and it's just flying around, um, then one of the best things to do is just open a door and hope it flies out on its own. You know, keep an eye on it, make sure it's not, um, make sure it's not landing anywhere. Um, and if it goes out on its own, great. Um, and if it isn't going out on its own, you can sort of help guide it to that area, you know, shut it, you know, shut the door so it can only stay in one area and try to coax it towards a window or a door. Um, and if you have uh, a butterfly net or something, those can be helpful too, if you can catch it. Um, and then get it outside. Um, but those are the sort of things to keep in mind uh, when there is a bat in your house um, and how to deal with it. Thanks. Um, I, I had another question that was in terms of the habitat loss and habitat getting broken into bits and stuff. Are there kinds of planning that people can do? Or are there any kind of regulations anywhere that people have to do some kind of assessment? You know, is there what what can be done about that piece? Yeah, so it sort of, you know, there, it, it depends on a couple things. Um, one, it depends on, you know, if the project at hand is, you know, a smaller scale, it's your personal property and you're doing um, some logging on it. Um, or if it's like a larger, you know, a larger federal project, you know, if there are federal dollars involved, then the Endangered Species Act starts to kick in for some of these species. Um, and typically, you know, what, what most people can do on their property um, is sort of make sure that there's a variety of different structures around the property. Um, so one of the things that, you know, I have worked on during my master's is assessing um, habitat use uh, across different features on the landscape. And um, what we found is that there, that many bat species use a, a pretty broad variety um, of these different habitat types. Um, and so making sure that you have that diversity of habitat um, and that you have, uh, that it is um, all accessible to those bats too, you know, like you don't have a very large area that's all clear cut. Um, that's, you know, hundreds of acres large, like hundreds of acres in area. Um, and making sure that you have sort of like smaller, um, smaller differences in habitat that can be easily accessed by an individual flying around is really one of the most important things that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, I think has a question. Yes, Kyle, thank you very much. Very informative discussion. Um, kind of got answered, but the, as far as the bat boxes, again, I put one up last year. 
So on my garage, I have a peak where they, I figured would be the best spot to put it. So I put it on the, the front side of the house. And I did have, within a couple of months, I had one bat, you know, with, I, I guess they call it like a bachelor bat. Maybe he didn't smell so good and the other ones wouldn't come. But, um, mm-hmm. but this year, I'm not finding anything there. But I am on the other side. I'm right on the Bear Camp River, like scary close. But on the other side, that's where I'm getting all the guano on the ground. Should I switch the bat box over there, or hopefully they'll come back out to the front? Yeah, so it, it might depend. Like I said, bats can be pretty picky, and sometimes it doesn't always seem like there's good reason behind it. Um, but I would, I would lean towards leave it where it is, um, and hopefully the bats will come back the following year. Um, because, you know, when you start to move stuff around, um, it can potentially cause them to, you know, it's a new structure. They may be a little wary of it. Um, but if you leave it in that one place, it seems more permanent. Um, and it seems likely to me that they may go back to that area. But yeah, sometimes bat boxes can take years to colonize. So it's actually kind of cool that you did even have one in there the first the first year. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would, I would definitely um, leave it where it is. Okay, great. Thanks. Do they come back year after year? Like you said, they migrate to a cave and then do they come back to the same spot? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, And to some degree, we don't really know, um, you know, if they're going back to the same areas um, over and over again, it's likely that they are, but bats are really hard to track across the year because they're so small um, typically, the way that you track them is you put a radio transmitter on them, um, and those radio transmitters only have batteries that last, at, even at the most, up to a couple of a couple of weeks. Um, and so it's really hard to to track bats back and forth. There are ways that we can keep track of individuals um, that you can put little bands. You may have seen on some of the pictures. Um, there are little forearm bands that you can put on them, um, so you can keep track of individuals, much like birds. Um, and so it's, it's pretty likely that they're going to the same hibernacula year after year because we see individuals um, in the same hibernacula counts. Um, but a little bit less is known about where they're going and if they're going back to the same places during, um, during the summer, especially with those migratory individuals. It, it, they probably are at least going to the same areas because, you know, we like to go back to places that we're familiar with, um, and it's the same thing for bats. Um, but it's, it's really hard to study those individuals that are moving long distances. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I was muted, wasn't I? <laughs> um. I had a question one just about the size and how much they weigh average for the bats. Yeah, Um, so it definitely depends on the species. Um, The smallest bat, if I'm remembering correctly, is the eastern Um, and they're very, very small. They rams, I, that's like four and six. I can't remember what the equivalent is because yeah, I'm in like metrics. Um, that's little. Pretty, you know, pretty small individuals that are a couple inch. Those, the hoary bats, um, which are the largest uh, species in eastern North America and of the species in um, in New Hampshire uh, are pretty big. I've only gotten the opportunity to handle one a few times, so the exact weight is um, is slipping my mind right now. Um, but they're probably uh, you know tail to snout, I bet five inches ish, um, and they have pretty big wingspans, um, a little a little over a. F- but uh, a little bit under a foot, I would say.
Any, does anyone else have questions? No, thank you very much. It's very interesting. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you all for coming. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Yes, thank you very, very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Everybody take good care of the bathroom. Yeah. And thank you, Cook Library and other hosts for putting this on. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Cook Library. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, too. Yes, yes, we're very grateful. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Yes, Kyle. I don't have mine set up. Have a good night now. Bye. Night. Take care. Thanks. Bye.